As night descends on Cape Disappointment and the Pacific Northwest, the Coast Guard is responding to calls for help. A rescue swimmer from Air Station Astoria plunges into cold, dark waters to save a mariner and his sinking vessel. And boat and air crews race the setting sun to locate a swimmer who vanished in the rough surf. It's getting a little dark for us, so we're going to call it. So we have night vision goggles on board, and we will continue the search. I hope he's alive. I hope not, too. High peaks and tumultuous waters make Cape Disappointment and the Pacific Northwest one of the most hazardous environments in North America. At the heart of it all is the Columbia River Bar. This deadly area has taken countless vessels and claimed hundreds of lives. In the air and on the sea, brave men and women of the U.S. Coast Guard risk their own safety so that others may live. In a place known as the Graveyard of the Pacific. Lieutenant Leo Lake, pilot, age 60, here at Sector Columbia River. There's a boat taking on water, has about 400 gallons of water on board, and the onboard bilge pumps aren't able to keep up. Crew report ready for takeoff. Ready, ready for takeoff. We're going to grab an extra pump, take that with us, and hopefully save his vessel. But with the boat taking on water, it can happen pretty fast that the boat will sink, and then we're, we're dealing with the person in the water. You said the helo let us know. Uh, yes. Jeremy Young, I'm a uh, operations controller at Sector Columbia River. We have a 36-foot fishing vessel, 25 nautical miles off the uh, Columbia River bar entrance. Uh, dangers being that area are um, everything. It's uh, Pacific Ocean. He's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Then he's by himself, and those two things alone are, are pretty dangerous. Then you add on taking on water. So at this time, we have a Coast Guard helo going out to him with a pump, and a 47 from Stage Cape Disappointment going out as well. Let the helo know 47 is 55 minutes out. 6035 Sector Columbia River, the 47 is 55 minutes out. Sector number 35, good copy on all. It was a nice clear night, but it was very dark out there. The moon had already set. There wasn't a whole lot of contrast between where the water stopped and the sky began. 6035, Sector Columbia River. Sounds like the situation is getting worse on board the vessel over. Sector from B6035, good copy, over. AC3, Ty Gansel, Air Station Story Rescue Swimmer. It took us about uh, 20 minutes to get on scene. Uh, we're four minutes out. I'll try to find that guy on the ESS. The ESS is uh, our infrared. Just pretty much just brings up any heat signatures out in the cold ocean. I think I got him on the ESS. There it is. Right in front of us. Just the vast ocean just popped out really good. The fishing vessel is definitely listing to the right side quite a bit. So you know he's been taking on quite a bit of water. Just the short period, eight foot chop was just rocking him side to side. So we're definitely uh, gonna wanna get on there and dewater it and help save his vessel. 
Charlie Carroll, Charlie Carroll, Coast Guard helicopter, channel 22. I believe we should be right over you about now, sir. Coast Guard Hilo. Yeah, yeah roger that. I see you over there on my uh, starboard side, over. Would you like us to deliver a pump? I'm by myself here, so it's going to take a little bit of doing to accomplish that, but I definitely need a pump, over. He's yeah, definitely going to need a, a hand on that boat, sir. You can't pull that pump in and try to dewater at the same time. 36-foot boat's pretty big for one guy to be on by himself. There's a lot to do, and especially when things start going wrong. So we elected to lower the rest swimmer down to help uh, the captain out. Dude, that thing is a mess. I don't know if it'd be safe to hoist you down yet or uh, or not. I'd just look at all the outrigging and think, where in the world are we going to hoist to this? There's not a whole lot of, of hoisting area, especially with all the stuff that was on deck rolling around. Doesn't make it a real safe spot for us to put our swimmer down. I see a mooring line on the port side. Could you climb up that? Yeah, if he's dead in the water, I could climb on board. We could do an indirect pump, pull that, and get this thing going. I recommended to not be hoisted down to that unstable vessel because it had so much rigging and it was really small. It was only 36 feet. So I uh, opted for harness deployment and just swim to the boat and uh, climb over the back of the boat. Right, so you check this complete. We're ready for one harness deployment of the swimmer. I'm going to come down to uh, 40 feet. First shot, just back me up. Oh, I don't want to get closer than 10 feet to it. Roger that, sir. AMT3 Rashad Gibson. Flight mechanic here at uh, Sector Columbia River. We're currently going out the door for a Sector Columbia River, Coast Guard Helicopter 6035. We're currently putting our swimmer in the water. I want to get the swimmer close enough to the boat so uh, he doesn't have to work as hard, but then you have to also make sure that uh, you're staying away from all the obstacles. You know, you have the mass to worry about, you have all the rigging to worry about. Swimmer is in the water holding. Roger. Uh, forward and right, 40. We're going to lose side of the boat here. And Whenever you're dealing with something at night, it's obviously going to complicate things. Uh, the pilots don't have visual references, so uh, you have to be that much more on your game and give them good counting commands. Easy after you hold. And swimmer's going to the water. Swimmer's in the water. Swimmer's away. I'll get lower to eight foot seas. Honestly, my mind's just getting in the water and getting on the vessel. Being a rescue swimmer, you just swim. Focusing on the task at hand. Swimmer's at the boat, and he's climbing over the hole now. And swimmer's on board. Get this pump up. I'm trying to save the pump. I'm happy. Would you be able to do a direct delivery of the pump with trail line underway? That's good. I saw the captain in the boat. I'll do it with the pump if you can keep the boat in a straight line. We had the captain of the boat steer a straight course for the helo to have a good reference because nighttime hoisting to a boat is probably as dangerous as you can get for pilots. Captain, for the 35, continue maintaining this course 030. Flying at night over the water, you don't have as much references to hold a steady cover. All you have is a boat, as well as hoping to God that you can pick up a horizon. In this case, we, we did not. Ready for one pump delivery with trail lines to the boat. I'm in the hoist. And trail line is flashing on the water and holding. This guy cannot steer a straight course to save his life. Yeah, he's coming, he's coming full around. I'm going to follow him around. Trail line was going down, Ty was tending it. The vessel started to make a, a right hand turn. I decided to follow the vessel around because if we get all tied up in the rigging, then we aren't able to, to fly away if we need to. He's going all the way around. The vessel continued around to almost a full 360 degree turn. I'm trying to arrest this spin right, right here. Uh, I'm going to lose sight of the boat here. As we're trying to deal with that, he came around underneath us. I lost sight of him and uh, I knew that his mass was right below us. Uh, come forward. Lost and, uh, up. Up, up, up. I'm just barely keeping pace with the water right now. There's a boat taking the water. It has about 400 gallons of water on board. I don't know if it'd be safe to hoist you down yet. Nighttime hoisting to a boat's probably as dangerous as you can get for pilots. I'm trying to arrest this spin right, right here. Uh, come forward. I see the mast kind of flash kind of underneath the helicopter. Lock and, target. Up. Up, up, up. and it was it was close. Okay, let's take a deep breath. 
It was a fairly significantly traumatic event, seeing how close that mass came to the bottom of the helicopter and, and getting that up call, the potential to be tied up in the rigging. Swimmer, go ahead. I think that's the helo. Station Cape Disappointment has dispatched a 47-foot motor lifeboat. Uh, 232, front of the 35. How long until you get on scene? 10 minutes. One, zero. Over. At that point, I, I did a, a risk analysis. They were about 10 minutes to get there. So I decided that maybe transferring that risk to 47 was a better option. It would be easier for them to put a pump aboard, and that would significantly reduce the risk of us going back over and, and possibly not being as, as fortunate as we were the first time. Well, where does lights go? When the uh, helo flew off to kind of reevaluate what was going on, about eight foot wave came over the starboard side and swamped the boat. And then all the power just went off. It just went. Rescue swimmer from the 3-5. The 47 is 10 minutes out. They'd be a much better platform to just pass a bump over so that, uh, we don't have to try and do that again. I said, we don't got 10 minutes. Boat's sinking now. And then another eight foot wave came over the starboard side. The ladder well, everything was filling up with water. Negative 1. The boat started to pitch like kind of like the Titanic and then went down and then got sucked under. Kind of a scary moment because I couldn't see what was pulling me down. I don't know if it was rigging, but it was probably just the undertow. Felt like an eternity, but it was probably only a few seconds. After the vessel capsized, then it's a completely different situation. Now we're dealing with uh, a swimmer and a survivor in the water, essentially. You have the target in sight, Rashad? Target is in sight. OK, you can begin the hoist. Roger. Fast is going out the door. Fast is going the way down, halfway down. Really, the only thing going through your head is we have to pick up the survivor and the swimmer as quickly as possible, because the water temperature is super cold. Quarter right, 30. We saw the rescue swimmer as well as the survivor on the right-hand side. And on the left-hand side, you can see the nose of the boat surfaced out of the water as well as debris. Right. Thank you. Right five. The survivor, he only had a uh, life vest on, so I'm sure he was super cold. So we wanted to make him a priority, obviously. And taking the load. That's down the water. Survivor on his way up. The survivor kind of looked out of it when he uh, first arrived in the, uh, the cabin. Survivor inside the cabin. After we uh, got the survivor situated and uh, secured, I just did another basket recovery of the swimmer. That's going out the door. It was a difficult case. Middle of the night with no, no uh, illumination and pilots were getting lost target and dealing with eight foot chop in a small boat. I mean, it's pretty challenging for sure. Roger, take the load and take the load. But, uh, you know, all is well in the end. Rescue 3235, 232, one handle, confirm, burn, foul, order. 232 from the 35, we have all personnel on board. It was surprising how fast that boat went down. It just sank. By the time we left scene, there was just debris floating on top of the water. Had we not been on scene, he could very well still be in that boat. How you guys been doing back there? Uh, he's just a little bit hypothermic. We've got a uh, blanket on him. We're warming him up with the ECS, so no EMS will be needed. I told the captain, hey, sorry, man. I wanted to save your boat. I know it's uh, your livelihood, but he was in good spirits. You know, he's like, hey, I get to see my family again. You get to live to see another day. So he was just really happy to be alive, which is the cool part about the job, you know? Once we can land the uh, KMD Hilo Paddy from Il Waco. OK. We are approximately five minutes out from landing at KMD. I do this job because I love being able to turn around and, and seeing the people that wouldn't have survived had we not been there. And it's awesome to be able to do that and to, to get that reminder of, of why we signed up. All right, can I escort this gentleman outside? Yep. Hey, Tom, we're sorry we couldn't save his boat. My name is Craig Daniel Lewis. I'm a commercial fisherman, lifetime. First time anything like this has happened. 
like way crazy. I mean, everything was in order. We had like six to eight inches of water in the bilge. I thought we had everything all wrapped up. But well, we took a bad wave. The next thing you know, it was history instantly. If you fish as long as I have, it's going to happen to you sooner or later. And the good news is that uh, I'm one of those stories that you can walk away and say, hey, boat sank, but you didn't die. Good job, everyone. Turned out to be an interesting day. Feels good just knowing that you, you help somebody live to see another day. I mean, it's, it's pretty awesome. Save lives, high fives. <laughs> Are not leaving hanging, that works too. <laughs> okay. Coast Guard Sector Columbia River. Hey, the local fires request the kilo for a 14 year old kid stuck on the cliff. That might be it. See the one on the right, that one literally holding on. She had kind of climbed around to the side, so she was in a washout area. And unfortunately, there was no way to go up, down, or sideways. So she was just kind of holding on to uh, a couple areas of grass. Tyler Gansel, survival technician, third class, air station Astoria. We're out here in the foothills, coast of Oregon, just doing joint agency training, which is kind of nice, change of pace. You guys have the uh, hoisting area inside off the left hand side? Yep, I do. That's got a good angle. That's a pretty straight looking cliff. Lieutenant Zach Bocek, we're working with Clatsop County Sheriff and Cannon Beach Fire and Rescue. We are prepared for this scenario. Hey, Roger, I understand. We'll be uh, making our approach. Summertime, we get lots of SAR cases. So we're doing this to make sure that they know how to best help us and so that we know how to best help them. Roger, I'm sorry, Sight. Boat check to the swimmer. Boat check complete. Swimmer is on the way down. I think vertical surface is a little more dangerous than water rescues. Sir, so a little bit and hold. So much can go wrong here, you know, with rotor wash considerations, pendulum swing on the side of a cliff. All right, swimmer has positive contact. Roger. Swimmer has lost positive contact. Back left 10. Roger. The wind coming off this cliff face causes some turbulence. Can we come down in altitude? I can't, I can't control them. Once I started getting close to the trees and whatnot, I was like, let's reevaluate this. So. Roger, I want to recover them. Swimmer's halfway up. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get them on the first try there. We had to abort the hoist. Swimmer's inside the cabin. Hoist complete. Roger. I can't do it from that high. We're going to have to come down. Now we could lose 30 feet. And then we decided, yeah, let's hoist from lower. Try it again. Swimmer's on the way down. Hold. Just got less swing now. It was stable enough and low enough that we were able to get them on the vertical surface. You gotta have that perfect little balance of what they're doing, the pilots, and what the flight mechanic is doing to get me to the survivor and hook him up. Survivor, survivor, clear the cliff. Back at right 50. It's been great working with the local agencies. It was a lot of fun. I think we got a lot of good training accomplished. That's good training. It's good. We got some good hoisting. Good flying. All right, here we go. Coast Guard Sector Columbia River. Hey, the local fires request the kilo for a 14 year old kid stuck on the cliff here off the Cape Lookout. 14 year old stuck on the cliff? That's great. That's true. And if they're out here, that gets real steep in that hole right there. It's not a good place. Voice of power. Area. Area is clear. Trooper ready to take off. Ready to take off. All right, that's good enough. ETA is two zero minutes. My name is Lieutenant Commander Nathan Coulter. We received a call from Neetarts Bay Fire and Rescue. They've got a female that's trapped on the cliff down in the vicinity of Cape Lookout. Definitely one, possibly three individuals. They are not in a secure location. The female, she's at risk for falling off. So we're going to get down there on scene as quick as we can. 
It's not uncommon for people to get stuck. Sometimes folks will go out and they'll go walking on the beach, go through some tide pools, climb over some rocks, and then before they know it, the exit that was the entrance to wherever they're at has now been closed off by breaking waves. And then they start to go up, and they start to climb up, and that maybe is easy initially, but then it becomes more difficult. And then they eventually reach a point where they can't go up anymore and they can't go down. And then that's when they call us. So you see those flashers off the nose? And I'm just thinking that might be it. One top right corner, two right next to each other. See the one on the right? Yeah, that one looks more precarious. He's literally holding on. ASTC, Joel Sayers. I'm the survival shop supervisor here at Air Station Astoria. The cliff that they were on was a little over 100 feet tall. The water pretty much was right up against the bottom. Two gentlemen that were down on the lower area, they weren't in as much danger, but the young lady had kind of climbed around to the side. Had she slipped or fallen, she would have fallen about 70, 75 feet into the ocean. Coast Guard Sector Columbia River. Hey, the local fires are about to kill over a 14 year old kid that's stuck on the cliff. Definitely one, possibly three individuals. They are not in a secure location. The cliff that they were on was a little over 100 feet tall. The water pretty much was right up against the bottom. And then just around the corner, there was a beach area. And that's where most of the MS was located. The young lady, she had kind of climbed around to the side. Had she slipped or fallen, she would have fallen about 70, 75 feet into the ocean. I'm actually more tempted to insert a little low and come up the lower. OK. She's facing in. So once I get this quick drop on, we're going to want to make a, a pretty quick move. We're dealing with a person that's in a really sticky spot on the side of a cliff, did not have a foothold at all, and was holding herself onto the cliff by a couple tufts of grass. Do you want to just short haul her to the beach? Where is the closest beach? It's right, off, it's right off the nose at 50 yards. Is there going to be any type of rescue crew down there? Yeah, there is. They're right off the nose. Roger that. All right, I like it. Also, the other two dudes look like they're all right, but I want to make sure that we don't blow them off or put them in a worse spot. So if it looks like it's going bad, then call a wave off, we'll back away. Some of the other considerations we have are the rotor wash from the aircraft can blow the survivor off of the cliff or can blow rocks and debris down onto the survivor and dislodge them or injure them further. If for some reason we lose them and they slip, we're going to need to pull away from the rock. We're going to have to go right to the water. OK, this will be a direct deployment of the rescue swimmer to a vertical surface to rescue the girl. Are there any questions? No questions. We need to go ahead and check someone to blow rocks down on her. All right, now we're catching her with the rotor wash now. Do I need to come up a little? Yes, sir, if you can. At that point, it was clear to me that we were too low. I'm very concerned. She could fall into the water, tumbling on the rocks. How's that? A little bit better for her? Yes, sir. Let's go from here, brother. All right, we're good right here, sir. Hey, Roger. Roger, this door is going open out for low tick. Low tick complete. The door is going down. The door is going down. I'm moving around. Easy right. It was a pretty high hoist. I want to say it was a little over 150 some feet. The door is going down. For me, being that far down, any movement of the helicopter can start a pendulum situation where I start to swing back and forth. Dangers of that are I may knock some debris down on the survivor or I may actually hit the survivor. Easy right. Jesus about five feet from the cliff face. Right above the survivor. Flight mechanic did an outstanding job. I was able to insert just to the right of her position. Summer is on the cliff, has positive contact. Summer is traversing down. Roger. Once I've got feet on and I think that she can hear me, then I'm going to start to talk to her. Last thing we want is for them to look at us and reach for us, then sliding down the face. All they need to do is to stay where they are and do what we ask. Summer, is that survivor? Summer is hooking up to the survivor. Very well. She was actually facing the cliff. I asked her if she was OK. Uh, she was. She seemed to be very, very upset. Summer is ready for pickup. Roger. Summer has broke positive contact. AET-1, Tito Sabangan. As soon as I get the pickup signal, I'm having the pilots back off the cliff um, as easy as we can. Summer is swinging clear off the cliff. Easy down. Once we came down to a safe altitude, we started to cruise to the beach. We are clear, east, out, and forward. 
she was very upset. So you want to reassure them as you're moving. Uh, I don't know how to describe it other than you're just having a conversation with them all the way. All right, we're at the edge of the shoreline. Domain survivor is about 10 feet off from the deck. Roger. Domain survivor is off on deck. Domain disconnecting. We were able to come around and actually very lightly place her down on the beach. I'm ready for pickup. Domain's coming up. We called in EMS, so they made their way in to help her, and we were able to go back and start looking at what we were going to do with the other two folks. These guys look like they're trying to make their way now. Bring or, your uh, light back down to them, please. Yeah, why don't we illuminate it for them at yeah. least? So illuminate their walk. Here you go, take a nice from the one three. Once we came back around the face, we were able to actually shine the light, and they were able to see. They realized that with some slow movements, they can make their way down to the rock and back to the beach. One guy's safe on beach. So we're down to one guy on the cliff, one guy on the cliff. Yeah, so the other guy's on the beach. He's taking another shoe so I can walk on the beach. Both of them were able to walk around the corner. They kind of did a hop, skip, and a jump through the water itself. They're both down. I'll slide uh, forward here, and we'll land right on the beach. Roger. And this should be a good spot. Before we come home, I just do one more beach landing and allow the chief to go out and debrief with the first responders on scene. And it looks like chief is walking back. Roger. Hello, all right. We're having a better night than she is. She all right? She, uh, yeah, she just scared out of her mind. Race towards light. OK, be lifting up. Roger. Clear. Thank you very much for your help, gentlemen. Have a pleasant flight home. The fire folks were happy. Obviously, the female survivor was happy, and uh, we were cleared to return to base. Fine job, fine job, you know, It was a tough spot. Sir, you did an outstanding job, Aubrey. Yeah, thanks, appreciate it. It's always a team effort. Uh, the Coast Guard as a whole is a tight-knit community, but aviation is even a more tight-knit community. Third party for approach. Hey, approach. Flying on a mission like this and helping somebody out is a great feeling, and we all love it, and that's probably why most of us join the Coast Guard. Good job. Appreciate work. it, sir. Yeah. Real hey, stay dry through the whole thing this time. Nice work. <laughs> This is a drill. Uh, I was calling from uh, the Seaview Beach approach, and uh, I saw a boat capsized just outside the surf line here. Uh, did you happen to see how many victims went into the water? Looks like five or six, a boatload. Lieutenant Scott McGrew at Coast Guard Station, Cape Disappointment. We are doing an annual beach rescue drill with a bunch of the Pacific County agencies. It has some risk inherent in the drill. We're putting Coast Guardsmen in the water as our victims. We launch on numerous persons in the water and, and beach rescue cases. If we don't do these types of exercises, if we don't coordinate our response beforehand, people can die. Pacific County can get on scene very fast with their jet skis. And in this uh, real shallow shore break, the jet skis work really well. When we're sitting here out in the water, you're very constrained by the dry suit. You can't really free swim at all. So we're just sitting there floating, waiting to be picked up. Just due to the six to eight foot swell, there's a lot that you don't see. We can hear the jet skis coming, but we can't see them. You know, we lost visibility of everything. You feel pretty helpless, and you really start to understand what some of these victims go through out on the water. My hands and my face were exposed. So after about five minutes of being in the water, I did start to feel cold. Wonderful, cold. And you guys heard real good? Oh. Three, four, five. Cold, cold. He's just feeling pretty cold. Still doing good? Yeah, I'm all right. I had a card with hypothermia symptoms on it, so when Beach Rescue came along, they'd know what my symptoms were and what my medical condition was. They're going to take you one guy at a time on the list. We were really relying on the response of the South Pacific County Technical Rescue Team. Those guys have some good skills. They're, they're well trained, but it's still a little nerve wracking. He's got your guy on a sled towing him in through the surf. It's fun to be able to get in the water and kind of be on the other side, see how things would go if we're the ones being rescued. The drill overall, I'd say, was you know a success. We put put six people in the water, and we got six people out of the water safely. 
Anytime people go in the water and they come back out and everything went off without a hitch, that's a good day. All right, one male in the water. Did he say anything else? 22 years old. The water temperature is about 54 degrees, so it increases our, our sense of urgency to get out there and, and show up before the person becomes hypothermic. I see something bobbing at 2 o'clock. It's very hard to search for someone in the water. The water is tumbling, and you can see how someone would get pulled under. My name is Lieutenant Commander Nathan Coulter. I'm the Assistant Air Operations Officer at an H-60 pilot at Sector Columbia River. When we get a call about a person in the water on the Washington or Oregon coasts, immediately we're thinking about uh, rip currents and the cold water involved. So a timely response is very important. Report ready to take off. Ready for take off. Second one three should be there. Two zero point over. I'm Lieutenant Leo Lake, one of the pilots here at Sector Columbia River. When there's a person in the water, that for us is kind of a critical thing. The water temperature, even in the summertime, is about 54 degrees. So it increases our, our sense of urgency to get out there and, and show up before the person becomes hypothermic or loses their ability to continue to swim. All right, one male in the water. Did he say anything else? 22 years old. I'd like to know if there's any other assets responding. Roger. Sector 6013. We're curious to know if there are any other assets responding. Over. 6013 is in sector. Roger. Currently there is a 25 on scene. There's also a beach party. When we were approximately five minutes out, we made contact with the Coast Guard 25 foot response boat. They were just a few miles south of scene. Change this appointment in 556. Request updated position. The remains the same. I don't any update. Roger. Name is Nathan Burns, BM1, Station Cape Disappointment. In the transit, every second counts. The conditions were definitely choppy. They were a lot rougher than you'd like to be going fast in the 25. Hang on here. Uh, so it was an uncomfortable ride. Didn't have any information how long he'd been in the water. So the sooner we can find him, the higher probability that if we have to perform CPR, we're going to have a good outcome with it. The president of water is a 22-year-old male with a white swim cap. How, how old? Copy over. Roger, was he wearing anything else? No other information was passed. Flashing lights on the beach there, you got the fire department probably ready to launch for jet skis. If they deploy jet skis. Fireman Connor Mercer, Station Cape Disappointment. We went north on the Long Beach Peninsula, and we arrived to Flashing lights, ambulance, fire trucks, the beach rescue trucks. Pretty much everybody resource from the peninsula itself was available and on scene. So we knew we were exactly where we were supposed to be. Station, we're on scene. We got our position. Right here, position. I'll keep the speed down. Go ahead and do it. Go out. One port, one starboard. Roger, you're going for it. We're just going to make a shoreline search. Roger, take your time. Mike Zimmer, MK2, Station Cape Disappointment. We got on scene probably 10 minutes after the call came in, which is a pretty good response time, all things considered, for where it's at. Our biggest concerns were time of day. We only had so much daylight left. Um, from that point on, we just started searching, just running uh, search patterns up and down the beach. Looks like he's got some person with a white cap on the back of that jet ski right there. No? Got it. You got an estimated where he went in at? Well, for this one right off, we struck him. Yeah. We have not seen anything. OK. He was 10 minutes in the water, minimum, like probably 15 at this point. Yeah. No sign of him. Okay. Really, he lives. He lives on the starboard side over land. When we arrived on scene, it was uh, very clear that there was a, a strong rip current in that vicinity. The water was you know, excessively turbid and turbulent. 
we're looking for maybe a head bobbing, an arm waving, maybe a little bit of splashing. I'm gonna slow down, we'll uh, start searching on the right hand side. Which is gonna be off the nose pretty much. We immediately began a low altitude, low speed, almost a hover search of the area. I see something bobbing at two o'clock. Do you see that right where that wave just went? Yeah, it's a crab posture. There's something hooked on it, that's probably what you thought. I was really hoping it was the person's head and then their hand. A23, Ben Jacob, Air Station Astoria. It's very hard to search for someone in the water. The water's tumbling, and you can see how someone would get pulled under. You automatically think that you can see you know, that white swim cap, but the water's breaking, so you have little white caps everywhere that you're thinking, man, that's a person, that's a person, and then it's not. Yeah, and uh, I got a pretty good feeling that it's probably pretty close in to where he went in the water. Got some more information as the case went along. It turns out he was out there with this church group. The boat's running the search pattern pretty good. Beach Command 556. Beach Command, go ahead. Roger, is there any family members that have a better update on what he was wearing or if he's able to swim or not? Uh, the update that we have is he wasn't a very good swimmer. Roger. Here in the Pacific Northwest, visitors come in and they don't realize it. They think it's California, Florida beaches. It's nothing like that. You can be standing on a beach here for five seconds right on the water's edge and you'll be standing in the hole. The undertow and the currents are so strong, people just get taken out. It's not something to be played with around here. We're just trying to find anything we can in the water, up and down the beach, every which way we can go. I got something in the water right off the bow. I saw it, yeah. Yep. You know what it is? I don't know what it is. went off for a person in the water. 22-year-old male with a white swim cap. Didn't have any information how long he had been in the water. So the sooner we can find him, the higher probability that if we have to perform CPR, that we're going to have a good outcome with it. 10 minutes in the water, minimum, probably 15 at this point. No sign of him. They got something in the water right off the bow. I saw it, yeah. Yep. You know what it is? How about a person? I don't know what it is. A balloon? It's like a balloon. Cases like this where we're searching for a prolonged period of time, uh, one of the biggest challenges, especially as we get into night, is staying focused making sure that we're being effective in our search, making sure that all of the crew is still effectively using scanning techniques. It's a very chaotic environment in the surf zone, and there's a lot of uh, red herrings, you know, with waves and white caps and stuff like that. I'm looking for a slight discoloration of the water. Beach Command, Coast Guard, you go ahead. Yeah, it's getting a little bad for us, so we're going to call it, and we're going to turn over to law enforcement. Roger right, that, sir. Appreciate you letting us know. We, uh, we have night vision goggles on board, and we will continue the search. Over. Approximately two hours of fuel remaining. So daytime is pretty much 100% uh, outside visual scan. But at nighttime, the swimmer uses the, the forward-looking infrared to, to try to find uh, the, those heat differences and heat signatures. Oh, buddy, where is this guy? I hope he's alive. I hope for that, too. That's about almost an hour now. At this point, a weak swimmer. I mean, it's kind of one of those tough things. We want to find the person. We want to discontinue the search and all go home. But you feel less and less like there's going to be a favorable outcome in terms of the person surviving. You know, you have to get past the fact that the outcome may not change, but you still need to do 100%. So they said uh, survivability like 20 hours plus, useful consciousness 15 hours plus, so you can expect that there'll be a Coast Guard asset here for the next 15 to 20 hours now. 6013 sector, after you finish your current search, 
approximately one hour. Come back and fuel. We'll look at reassess the weather at that time and uh, reassess any developments. Uh, we will have a motor lifeboat on scene, uh, working probably throughout most of the night uh, and anticipate uh, the next move for our air asset. Oh, man. Now you're thinking, we want to bring closure to the family. We want to bring closure to the other first responders, the friends, other people on scene. All right, guys, so what we're doing, we're going to do a shoreline search south. We're going to stay safe distance off the beach, but we'll be just doing a shoreline search until uh, we get comfortable on the North Jetty, and then we'll be Back when we first got underway, we all had the mentality that we're going to go find somebody, pull them out of the water, and go home happy. As it turns out, after two, three, four hours, with the temperature of the water up here, the currents that we have are so strong off the beach, the rip currents, um, the strongest swimmer in the world would have issues with it. Just knowing there's nothing you can do about it just kind of kind of sucks. Pacific Northwest is not going to always give something back that's taken away right away. It was definitely good that he was able to be found on the beach the next day and the family was able to have some closure. We all loved our jobs, but these are the days that you wish you did something else. It does hurt. You understand more of what you do and why we're out here. And we do everything we can until there's nothing else we can do. When something tragic like this happens, it's it's difficult. You have to kind of keep going, obviously. You're, you're out here to do a job, the realistic part that not every day is going to end a happy one. But um, you got to keep pushing forward and, and, and looking forward to the next case, the next person that you can save. We're going to be back out again tomorrow to, to make a difference to save someone's life the next time.